Okay. Well, hello and welcome. I'm Robert Shipley, former professor of urban and regional planning at the University of Waterloo and the retired director of the uh, Heritage Resources Center. Currently, I'm a member of the policy committee of the um, Architectural Conservancy of Ontario, and it's on behalf of the ACO that I greet you today. By the way, there are 250 people registered, which is the maximum for this platform. We are aware of recent changes in the planning regime in the province, changes that impact heritage. And so the ACO has partnered with Community Heritage Ontario and with the cooperation of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing to present this workshop. But before we go further, we need to turn our attention to Indigenous land recognition. Since we are spread across too many lands and territories to name, I invite all of us, but especially settler people, to take a few minutes after this workshop to reflect on the meaning of Indigenous land recognition to us as individuals. Today, we have two members of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing staff, Catherine Mills and Danielle Demarche, who will be giving us a summary of the legislative changes that impact heritage. They will take about 15 minutes. They will be followed by Ann Fisher, who's the Program Manager for Heritage Planning in the City of Toronto, who will comment on the changes from a municipal perspective and will take about 10 minutes. Following the presentation, the panel will be asked to address a number of questions which have been submitted in advance by workshop participants. We won't be taking uh, on online questions today. Uh, I need to be clear that today's workshop is focused on planning legislation since that is the expertise of the Ministry of Municipal Affairs staff. We plan a future workshop to deal with the Heritage Act, and we hope to be joined then by staff from the Ministry of Culture, Sport, Tourism, and Heritage Industries. Um, I think that we can begin if we have no uh, we have no technical issues, uh, Alex. No, nope, we're all set. Uh, good. So, Danielle and Catherine, the floor is yours. Excellent. Are you able to hear me okay? Perfect. Okay. Um, so as Robert mentioned, um, my name is Danielle and I'm with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. And I'm also joined by my colleague, Catherine. It is great to be here and thank you so much for joining us on a Saturday morning. Uh, so I'm going to start with a one slide overview of the framework of the planning system. And then Catherine and I are going to dive into recent changes this government has made to land use planning use. policy. Yeah, it is. It's to be working. Okay, and I think I'm hearing a little bit of feedback in the background. So if you're just able to mute your mic there. So continuing on to slide number two. Um, excellent, Alex, if you could just change that to slide two now. So I'm going to start out my presentation at the highest level. This is a bird's eye view of planning. I realize that the group that we have on this call has uh, quite a range of different backgrounds in planning or varying levels of knowledge on the system. And for those of you with a planning background, this particular slide, this one slide is going to be somewhat rudimentary, but I want to take that minute to make sure we're all on the same page. So the image on the left of your screen with the different colored boxes, this helps with that big picture view and it gives us a sense of the different sets of rules in the land use planning space and who makes those rules and how the hierarchy of rules works. So which ones have to conform to which other rules. So starting at the top in orange, we have those two boxes. Um, up at the very top uh, is the Planning Act. And the Planning Act sets out, as you likely know, the rules for how planning applications should be processed, setting out things like timelines and consultation requirements, et cetera. Just below that, we have the provincial 
policy statement. Um, so this sets out the big picture vision that the province has for land use planning in Ontario. So those are the overarching visions. The idea that growth should be directed primarily to settlement areas, for example, or that agricultural land should be protected. So those two things I've just mentioned apply across the whole province. Then we're getting into the box just below that in green. These are the provincial plans that apply to large areas, often spanning municipalities, but not the whole province. So some examples of a provincial plan might be the Greenbelt plan or the growth plan. And then below that on the slide in blue, these are all of the different planning rules that are up to municipalities to establish. And what this picture shows you is the hierarchy of the pieces in the land use planning space. So the municipal rules that are in blue, they must conform upwards to any relevant provincial plans above them, and then they must all conform upwards to the provincial policy statement and to the planning act. So that's why we describe Ontario's planning system as being a provincial led system with municipal implementation. So municipalities have considerable discretion to put in place all of the implementation rules that are in blue, but with the caveat that those rules must conform up to the provincial vision. This model is similar to many other jurisdictions and it tries to strike a balance between centralized planning and local flexibility. Although I think we all know it can be hard to find that exact right balance in this space. Okay, so that is the caveat just to make sure we're all on the same page around land use planning. And I'm now going to move into recent changes in this area uh, that the government has made. So moving on to the next slide, Alex. So now that we've covered the foundation of land use planning, the rest is on these recent changes. So the current government's priorities include increasing housing across the province and cutting red tape. And so to address those priorities, the government held a large consultation during winter 2018-19. Um, and this consultation received significant public input, over 2,000 submissions, and it revealed five high-level themes that needed to be addressed. So that uh, related to housing was the speed, cost, mix, rent, and innovation. So speed being that we need to speed up the process for a construction project, cost showing that there's a lot of different layers of permits and what can we streamline in that process. We want a mix of different types of housing and development projects happening. With relation to rent, there are more people uh, looking to rent than we might have had stock at that point in time. And innovation, it's possible for Ontario to explore innovative ways to be going about uh, in the land use planning space. So moving on to the next slide. Um, excellent. So the action plan itself was released in 2019 and is an overarching aspirational document, the Housing Supply Action Plan. The plan itself didn't make specific legislative changes, but as a result of the objectives from the plan, there were changes made to many other pieces of legislation, including the three that you see shown here on the bottom of the screen. And so that's what we're gonna run through today. Changes to the Planning Act made through Bill 108, talking about the new provincial policy statement that came out in 2020, and also the, uh, the growth plan um, a place to grow, growth plan for the Greater Golden Horseshoe. So it's worth noting that although the housing supply action plan is definitely framed in the context of housing supply and that's at the heart of it, it also wanted to focus on streamlining development approvals more broadly, supporting jobs, cutting red tape. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Thanks, Alex. So, this slide is looking at Bill 108 changes, specifically in relation to the Planning Act changes that it made. I know, and I think most of you know, that Bill 108 also made changes to other pieces of legislation, including the Ontario Heritage Act, which is sometimes referred to as OHA. And those changes to the Ontario Heritage Act are not yet proclaimed. The OHA changes are actually being worked on by a different team at the provincial government located in a different ministry than myself and Catherine. 
So unfortunately, we're not able to speak about any of those changes in detail today. But as Robert mentioned, I think he has a vision for potentially future conversations that could be had on those changes. So speaking specifically about the Bill 108 changes that were made to the Planning Act that are showing up on this slide. So uh, Bill 108 it made many changes to the Planning Act, including um, some changes that are relevant across the province, but might be less relevant to some of you in this space. And so changes to support the construction of additional residential units, also changes to focus the use of inclusionary zoning to specific areas in a municipality, and changes to support the use of the community planning permit system. But the most significant changes to Bill 108, and probably the ones that affect this audience the most, were changes to reduce the length of time that municipalities have to do their reviews, therefore streamlining the approvals process and speeding up the development process to more quickly get housing built and to get projects off the ground, to get those shovels in the ground. Uh, we realized that some municipalities had been struggling to meet the planning timelines before they were shortened. And so some of those municipalities could be experiencing some difficulty meeting the new timelines now. However, as many of you know, timelines in the Planning Act are significant because it is possible for a matter to be appealed to LPAT if a municipality doesn't make a decision within that given timeline. But just because a timeline has passed does not always mean that it will be immediately appealed. The appeals process takes a long time, a lot of resources. And so there is still incentive for all parties, for example, for a developer to work with a municipality and other interested parties to see if they can reach a common ground solution without going all the way through the appeals route to LPAT. Okay, moving on to the next slide, Alex. So this is now looking at changes that were made to the provincial policy statement. So there was a new PPS released last year, the Provincial Policy Statement 2020, and that replaced the PPS 2014. This new PPS made a number of changes in a lot of different areas, uh, some of which are more relevant to different audiences. But in particular, I want to highlight a couple as being the most relevant for this group. So the new PPS enhances the municipal engagement requirements with Indigenous communities, especially in relation to the management of cultural heritage and archaeological resources. Uh, the new PPS also aligned the policies and the definitions with the recent changes to the Ontario Heritage Act. It includes an updated definition of cultural heritage landscape, which now includes features such as buildings and views in that definition. And the PPS 2020 also broadened how a cultural heritage landscape is recognized meaning that it doesn't have to be OHA designated. It could also be designated on a federal registry or other international registry or protected through uh, an official plan. In the Q&A period coming up at the end of this morning's presentation, we're going to get into a bit more detail about these changes and definitions, since those are some of the questions that we received through the pre-submitted questions in this space. Um, and the PPS also enhances environmental policies, directing municipalities to prepare for the impacts of a changing climate. Um, and one final note on the PPS, it also continues to maintain many important features and themes that were from previous PPS documents. So that includes things like protecting the green belt and other important natural features. So I'm gonna pass it over now to my colleague, Catherine, who will talk about a couple more recent government. Wonderful, thanks, Danielle. Uh, if we can just move on to the next slide. Perfect. 
Um, so as Danielle had mentioned a little earlier, one of those sort of three pillars of the housing supply action plan was the issuance of a new growth plan. And so growth plans are nothing new. They have been in place in the Greater Golden Horseshoe since 2006. Um, but in this case, there is a new growth plan, which is a third growth plan um, called A Place to Grow. And it included a number of new or revised policies in uh, five key areas, which are employment planning, agricultural and natural heritage systems, major transit station areas, settlement area boundary expansions, and intensification and density targets. And so a few of the, the highlights of those changes include establishing 31 provincially significant employment zones, or PZs as we like to call them for short. Um, and one of the key things about those is that they require provincial um, approval for conversion of non-employment uses. Streamlining planning around major transit station areas or MTSAs. And expanding the area around the stations to be planned to, to meet minimum density targets. There's also a streamlined process for municipalities to adjust settlement area boundaries to make expansions of up to 40 hectares and the ability to round out rural settlement area boundaries. The setting of, an, of uh, density and intensification targets and enabling all municipalities to request alternative density tar alternative targets through a simplified process were also some of the changes. Of note on the heritage front is that there were actually no changes to the policies that are located in 427, which are called cultural heritage resources between uh, those same policies that were in the 2017 growth plan were actually pulled forward and put in the new 2019 uh, place to grow. If we can just move on to the next slide. And so another tool you may have heard um, quite a bit around recently is a minister zoning order. The minister does have uh, unfettered authority to make a minister zoning order or, or MZO, which is similar to municipal zoning bylaws. Uh, MZO prevails over local zoning and it can help speed up and remove barriers to development or address other matters of provincial interest. Examples of where an MZO has been used in the past have been quite diverse. So everything from uh, the Honda plant in Alliston, uh, a recent one is modular housing in, in Toronto. They were used to facilitate uh, a grocery store being built in Elliott Lake when the current one was, um, uh, was damaged. And also to maintain the air ambulance flight path to St. Mike's Hospital in Toronto. So those are some really diverse ways in which this tool has been used in the past. And so while the authority to make a, a minister zoning order is not new, recent changes through Bill 197 have enhanced the authority by enabling the minister to remove municipal site plan control and require agreements concerning specific site plan matters, to apply inclusionary zoning, which is an affordable housing requirement, and also the ability to amend these enhanced minister zoning orders without first needing to give public notice. And so really these changes are intended to support the delivery of transit oriented communities, uh, to support more affordable housing and to really help streamline the implementation of strategic economic development projects by removing barriers and potential approval delays. We can just move on to the next slide. And so another recent change that has, uh, that has followed was uh, an amendment to the, the growth plan 2019. It was amended, came into effect uh, sort of August of last year. And some of these key changes include extending the planning horizon for which municipalities must plan and manage growth from 2041 to 2051. This means that municipalities must ensure that there are sufficient opportunities to accommodate forecasted growth until 2051. There were updates to the population and employment forecasts for upper and single tier municipalities and those forecasts um, 
went to 2051 now. It also enables municipalities to plan for growth forecasts that are higher than the ones in a place to grow, but not lower. And also some tools around streamlining the conversion of lands in employment areas that are both within a provincially significant employment zone and an MTSA, or a major transit station area, to permit other uses. Uh, on the heritage front, the same policies in that 427 uh, continue. However, there were some changes to the definitions to align with the PPS 2020. And that includes some of the definitions for things like cultural heritage landscape and conserve. Excuse me, uh, uh, Catherine. Yes. Yeah, it's right. Uh, ju just a note to to keep in mind the time limits. Okay. Um, I think yeah, we just I, have uh, two more slides. Uh, that's good. Yeah. Perfect. Um, and so I'll go very quickly. One of the chain, one of the policies in a place to grow requires the Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing to issue a land needs assessment methodology and for municipalities to use this methodology. So one of the, the other recent changes was the issuance of this land needs methodology. And it really just sets out the process and requirements for municipalities to determine how much land is needed to accommodate forecasted growth. Um, and I'll just move on. I think that is basically, if we move on to the next slide, that is essentially the end of our presentation. Um, if you just go on to one more, Alex. And in this case, we've provided some useful link to some of these documents that we have spoken about, and also an email address in case there are any additional questions. Um, okay, thank you very much, Ministry uh, people. I appreciate your uh, presentation there. And um, if we can move on to um, uh, Ann Fisher. Are you, um, are you I'm, uh, able I'm to be here. heard? I'm, I'm oh. here. I'm just waiting for my presentation to come up. Okay. Uh, great. Uh, uh, next slide, please. Uh, good morning. Um, I'm not going to be talking about all the changes brought about by Bill 108 today because I just don't have the time. I'm going to be focusing on the changes that affect the review of development applications, namely planning applications that involve heritage buildings and the heritage permit process. Um, I will talk about the impact of the draft regulations, but note these are only draft and they may be changed. Um, also note I'm still working through some of these changes, so I don't have all the answers. And finally, any opinions I give here are those are mine are not those of the City of Toronto. Um, so um, can we go to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, first, I wanted to explain uh, the, some of something of the relationship between heritage conservation and how it affects the Planning Act. This hasn't actually really been changed as a consequence of Bill 108, but it can be quite difficult to marry the Planning Act and the Ontario Heritage Act. And it's easy for heritage, the heritage conservation requirements from the Planning Act to be overlooked as we plan for growth. Um, so I want to make clear that heritage planning is one of the many things that have to be considered when implementing the Planning Act. Um, the PPS and the Growth Plan do provide more advice um, on how this should be done. Um, the PPS says that significant heritage resources shall be conserved. This is not an option, it's a requirement. If the resource is significant, it must be conserved. So the issue here is what is what does the significant heritage resource and then what does conserved mean? Uh, to be a significant heritage resource, you have to comply with a, one of the criteria in OREG 906. If a property complies with one of these criteria, it is significant and as such, it has, should be conserved. Just because a property isn't currently designated doesn't mean it's not significant or that the requirement under the PPS for its conservation doesn't apply. 
However, the benefit of being designated is that the significance of the property has already been established. The designation by law will be there and it should explain why the property is significant and what its heritage attributes are. Um, when it's not designated, you need to establish these things early in the process to ensure effective conservation. So then I go back to what is conservation? Um, the PPS offers this definition that is um, on the screen here in front of you. You can see this is a broad definition. Um, how and what form the conservation takes place is a matter of negotiation and discussion as part of the planning application. So it's, it's not whether or not there is conservation, but what form the conservation takes. And please note that the definition of conservation here does not include the, uh, the word demolition. Therefore, the, dem the complete demolition and documentation of a heritage resource does not amount to conservation. Um, the Planning Act uh, does give broad approvals, but the Ontario Heritage Act ensures the conservation and it deals with details. Um, so when you have a development application that includes the heritage resource, first you need to determine whether or not the heritage resource is significant. If it's significant, it needs some conservation. Um, heritage conservation isn't about preventing growth or change, it's about managing it so that through the implementation of the Planning Act, the cultural heritage value and interest of the property is, return, is, is retained. Um, the growth plan also requires conservation. Um, it says, as you see here, cultural heritage resources will be conserved in order, to, in order to foster a sense of place and benefit communities, particularly in growth areas. I have highlighted two words here. One is the word will, so that means this is a requirement. Cultural heritage resources will be conserved. Um, and the purpose of it is to foster uh, the sense of place and benefit communities. And the second one is the word particularly. This means that extra care is needed to conserve heritage resources in strategic growth areas, such as major transit stations. Therefore, in areas where you're having the most growth and change, um, it is particularly important to conserve the significant heritage resources. Um, please note Bill 108 hasn't changed um, these requirements. But marrying um, the Planning Act and the Ontario Heritage Act is complex. Uh, can I have the next slide, please? So Bill 108 brings actually a direct link between the Heritage Act and the Planning Act. Um, and that link is called the prescribed event. Um, the prescribed event is in the Ontario Heritage Act, uh, but um, it's not in the Planning Act. But it does mean a process in the Planning Act triggers a process in the Heritage Act. The prescribed event initiates the designation process. Um, so what is a prescribed event? Um, this is the notice of a complete application under the Planning Act. It only affects zoning bylaw amendments, official plan amendments and subdivision applications, not site plan applications, minor variances or consents. At least that's what the draft regulations currently say. Um, so why is this important? It's because 90 days after the prescribed event, you cannot designate a heritage property for which there is a related planning application. This prohibition on designation doesn't last forever. After a stated period, you can designate again. But this will be after the Planning Act application has been determined. So when the heritage values and attributes of the heritage resource are most under threat and most changes taken place, you will have no power to require conservation unless you designate. Um, the province is keen to designate early in order to have more certainty. The idea is that the property owner, with when it's designated, the property owner would know whether or not the, that, that, that the property is a significant heritage resource. It, it will know why it's important and it will know what the heritage attributes are. So in theory, this feels like it's bringing certainty to the process. However, in my experience, developers don't like to designate early. They prefer the heritage value not to have been established early because they gives them greater flexibility in the negotiation process. Um, so then how does this affect the heritage planner or the um, municipal planner? First thing is you have to work fast uh, to get the designation. You only have 90 days after the issuing of a notice of intention to designate. And in that time, you have to undertake the research have some kind of community consultation to help understand the heritage value, prepare a report, 
go to the Municipal Heritage Committee, go to council and issue a notice. This is quite a lot to take place in a short space of time. And in smaller authorities, the person who's doing all of this is also undertaking probably the review of the planning application at the same time. If you don't designate in this time, it's going to be much more difficult to secure effective conservation and fulfill that uh, PPS requirement uh, for conservation. This is because as a result of the planning application, there's going to be a lot of change taking place on the site and you won't be able to use the Ontario Heritage Act to ensure effective conservation. Remember, the planning ap ap application is still uh, going on, it's still being negotiated and that's bringing about a lot of change. And you want to ensure that this change accounts for the conservation of the heritage resource. Um, in addition, if the Planning Act application uh, goes to appeal, it's going to be much harder for you at the appeal to uh, argue that the heritage resource is significant and requires conservation. Because if you didn't designate it in that 90 days, that's because you'll be asked, um, you'll be, the people against you um, will ask you why you didn't designate it. There was the opportunity in the Act to do it. If you didn't designate it in that time, um, then it's going to be much harder to defend that point that it is significant and it needs conservation. The regulations do have some prescribed exemptions to the prescribed event. Um, uh, there are essentially four exemptions. One is when the owner and the council agree that they either don't need to apply the 90 day period or they want to give themselves an, uh, some extra time. So they set a different date. Um, so it's worth in your complete application requirements under the Planning Act um, to ask this question um, of a property owner an early, at an early stage so that you have an answer to this question. Um, and the other, another one is when there is an emergency has been declared, such as we have now. Um, in those circumstances, the 90 day period begins after the emergency period has ended. There is also a situation where um, 50, 15 days after the 90 day period has ended, um, you, the council can decide, can say that the Municipal Heritage Committee hasn't been consulted, then the, there'll be extra time. This is those circumstances such as when there's been a summer recess or after an election when the Municipal Heritage Committee isn't standing. And then the fourth exemption is when council passes a resolution, say that they have received new and relevant information relating to the property or to the event, the event being the planning application. Um, the information or materials have to affect or, or affect or potentially affect the determination of the cultural heritage value or interest of the property or it has to affect or potentially affect the evaluation of the potential effect of the development on the cultural heritage value or interest of the property. This information or materials has to have been received after the prescribed event has occurred and it mustn't have been part of the original planning application submission. So this would be something like at a community meeting where you found out some new information about the cultural heritage value of the property or of the implications of the planning application. Um, when this happens, you're given another uh, 180 days. So what are the implications or my recommendations um, as a consequence of these changes? The first thing relates to the pre-application meeting. Um, before the pre-application meeting, it's a good idea to have had a look at the property uh, carefully to determine whether or not you think it's likely to comply with the OREG 906 requirements. Um, and if it, you think it does, you say so at the meeting. Um, you ask uh, for a heritage impact assessment because you say that your research suggests that this property warrants conservation as part of this development in order to comply with that PPS requirement of the conservation of your significant heritage resources. And then it's a good idea to start uh, the research um, into the property at this time. Another thing to do is to make sure that you have either prepared or reviewed your terms of reference for heritage impact assessments so that they are robust and you can make a planning application incomplete if the information submitted is not sufficient. The heritage impact assessment has two elements to it. One relates to the examination or evaluation of the cultural heritage value of the property itself and the other one explains the conservation strategy. 
The reason why I'm saying this is uh, under the Planning Act, you only have 30 days to determine whether or not and that the planning application is complete or not. If your heritage impact assessment terms of reference are clear and robust, not only is it much easier to make that determination, it's also easier to defend that determination if it is appealed. The complete um, application process under the Planning Act isn't about, um, it's only about having enough information to make a decision. It's not make an assessment of the application itself, whether it's supportable or not. And it's not to review whether or not revisions would make it more appropriate. It's just a determination of whether or not the information you have is enough to understand the scheme and its implications. So in terms of uh, heritage issues, uh, you need to have enough information to demonstrate uh, whether or not the property is of cultural heritage value or not, in, in, whether or not it complies with OREG 906. Uh, and you need to have evidence in it to support this. A chart um, with a bunch of tick boxes actually isn't sufficient. You need to be able to, you need to have something in there, an opinion with evidence to support whether or not it is um, of heritage value. Um, and then you need to have the conservation strategy because um, if it's significant, it needs to be conserved. Um, and as I've said before, conservation does not include complete demolition. If somebody is taking down and rebuilding um, a building, that isn't conservation, it is demolition with mitigation. You need some conservation. Um, you need some conservation to ensure that the cultural heritage value or interest of the property is being retained. And once the prescribed event has taken place, um, you have two parallel processes taking place. You have the planning act where you're negotiating appropriate conservation and then you have the designation process taking place. I'll talk really briefly about appeals. Um, appeals with, um, under the Heritage Act are now going to LPAT, not the CRB. The implications of that are, firstly, I think there's likely to be more appeals against designations. Um, uh, part of that is because previously the appeals went to the Conservation Review Board. They made their recommendations they, that went back to Council and Council made the ultimate decision. Um, now the appeals will go to LPAT, who will make the ultimate decision. So owners um, before were less likely to appeal designations because council was coming up with a final decision and they'd looked at it before. Now there's going to be a new body looking at it, so they'll be more encouraged to have this outside body making that determination. And can I yeah. um, interject uh, just uh, a, a attention to the time? Right. Um, oh, gosh, yes. I don't. Right. Oh, well, I'll, I'll leave off the rest of the appeals then. Um, I was going to talk about prescribed event, um, principles. I'll leave that off. I'll just come back to um, the heritage permits. And so if you move on a um, slide. I was going to do a brief introduction to the principles. I won't talk about these, but I will point out the highlighted section here, which I say the principles, uh, you now have to um, demonstrate an openness and transparency by considering the views of all persons. That's going to be quite confusing. Um, the, so I'll go on to the next slide. So the heritage permit process, the main changes are with part four applications you now have this new uh, requirement which is the or new permit type which is the demolition or removal of uh, properties heritage attributes this is going to be confusing to determine what is a what is the com com demolition or removal of an attribute and how it differs from um, an alteration hopefully the um, toolkit will help this out also, you now have this thing uh, where it's the demolition or removal of a building or a structure, whether or not the demo this affects the property's heritage uh, values or attributes. That means you need to have permission if you're removing any shed or structure on a designated property. Um, can you go to the uh, next slide then? Um, the main change with regard to properties um, or application types um, and properties in heritage conservation districts is this new requirement, uh, which again relates to the removal of heritage attributes, though it's slightly more complicated here with heritage um, districts because this is the demolition of removal of an attribute of a property that affects the heritage attributes described in uh, an HCD plan. So first of all, you need to determine whether or not it's an attribute of a property and then you need to look 
look at your heritage district plan to see what its attributes are. This is going to be more complicated um, uh, to make those determinations. And again, there is a lack of clarity about what is a heritage attribute. And then finally, I just want to make a few comments. Of, we have this uh, new complete application requirements um, that are included in the regulations. They only relate to part four properties. They don't relate to uh, part five properties. Um, so there is some inconsistency. Um, they do allow you to ask for more information. Um, uh, so that if you have a lot of uh, heritage permit applications affecting part five properties, it's worth considering consolidating them so that um, you have uh, streamlined requirements or the same requirements for everything. It's also worth looking at these complete application requirements so that you know and uh, how you want to interpret this and update your municipal code accordingly. Um, they, uh, it's a good idea to, when you do this, to actually look at your definitions of complete applications from the Planning Act so that you can streamline things and, and integrate these processes as much as possible. Um, when you have your decision letters, make it very clear um, what you're approving because you have all these new application types. Um, so I just want to finish. I've tried to cram an awful lot into 10 minutes. Um, so my recommendations are to designate early within that 90 days um, um, as much as possible and start and as a consequence of that start your review uh, at pre-application stage. Um, renew, uh, review your terms of reference for heritage impact applications, uh, terms of reference for heritage impact um, assessments, and then update your complete application requirements for heritage permits. I've raced through that. Is that okay, Robert? Yes. Thank you very much, Anne. So uh, <clears throat> now we, um, if we want to finish uh, within our, our time limit, we have about uh, 20 minutes uh, for, for questions. And I'm going to, uh, uh, th these are questions that were pre-submitted and some of them were combined uh, if, um, if they overlap. So let me begin. Um, in a question, sorry, Robert. Uh, Alex, do you think you could also add Sean Fraser as a presenter where he's also going to be answering questions alongside us? Thanks, Alex. Uh, is okay, that possible, sorry. Alex? Um, okay. Yeah. Robert, we so, can continue with the questions. I think Alex can probably figure that out behind okay. the scenes. <laughs> okay, uh, for for the participants, uh, Mr. Fraser, who's being uh, uh, added here to be able to respond to some of these questions, I'm not sure of his title exactly, but he is um, an official in the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing. So, um, if I can, I'll I'll start with the uh, with the first question. Um, under the initial LPAT rules, any citizen who raised concerns at either the informal or formal public meetings was entitled to appeal to LPAT. Citizens who hadn't voiced concerns earlier uh, weren't allowed to come to in after the decision had been made. Um, what is the, uh, is the new rule? Um, I'm happy to take on that question there. So excellent question about getting involved. It's an important piece. So the Planning Act encourages early upfront involvement and it's always beneficial to make sure your views are known early in the planning process. For certain types of planning decisions, you are right, you are not eligible to appeal if you had not made your views known early in the process. That is uh, the case at the moment as well. There are also some planning matters though, such as consent or minor variance applications, which although they do not specifically require that you participate in the consultation process in order to appeal, the LPAT actually still has the discretionary power to dismiss an appeal without holding a hearing if the person or public body that launches that appeal has not made verbal presentations or written submissions before municipal council made a decision. So the bottom line answer on all this is yes, it is still important to get involved early if you want to maintain your appeal rights. Okay. So some good advice there uh, on on timing. Um, I'm I'm not going to specify who I think should should answer. I'll let you um, if you if you feel you have a, a panelists have uh, the the answer or some comment to make, uh, feel free to do that. 
So moving on to the second question, uh, this one's shorter. Um, how does the government intend to protect the context of heritage properties and districts in the midst of intensification pressures? Who would um, like and to I can take it. Oh, sorry, I was going to say I can take a stab at this one. Catherine, please. Um, so I think first and foremost, both the PPS 2020 and A Place to Grow provide direction on how to apply the policies. And so it's really that the PPS says that you have to read the whole document in its entirety and all the relevant policies are to be applied to each situation. So you can't just kind of pick and choose to say um, this one, this one is, we'll, we'll get this because it's one policy. Um, and I think in addition, when you look at the Planning Act, one of the matters that's of provincial interest is the conservation of features of significant architectural, cultural, historical, archeological, or scientific interest. The, the PPS 2020 and A Place to Grow both have policies that pertain to cultural heritage resources. The, the PPS states that significant built heritage resources shall be conserved. It also contains policies regarding uh, development and site alterations on adjacent land to a protected heritage property to ensure that the proposal has been evaluated and it has been demonstrated that the heritage attributes of the protected heritage property will be conserved. In addition for municipalities within the Greater Golden Horseshoe Growth Plan area, and that's the area to which a place to grow applies, there are policies which provide for cultural heritage resources to be conserved, particularly in strategic growth areas, and direct municipalities to develop and implement official plan policies and strategies for the identification and wise use and management of cultural heritage resources. Municipalities are also directed to prepare a strategy to achieve the intensification target and intensification generally within the built up area which includes looking at matters such as identifying the appropriate type and scale of development in strategic growth areas and things like the transition of build form to adjacent areas that might also be applicable. Um, and something else to sort of consider in the PPS is uh, policy 171, which looks at uh, a sense of place. Okay, um, Anne, did you have any comment on that uh, on that question? Uh, my advice would be um, to um, try to list heritage properties um, um, whenever you can. So, as part of any, uh, have your heritage register as up to date as you can. As part of any secondary plan review, um, add to your heritage register as much as possible. Um, the reason for that is as you're planning for change, you know where your heritage resources are. So you know where you have to think of where that they, they should be accommodated. And the other thing as part of any development application is to look at where the heritage resources are, look at what you have and determine their heritage value early so that they can be effectively conserved. Um, and uh, Sean, anything that you, you want to add there? Oh, um, your your uh, microphone isn't on. Uh, that better? Yeah, that's better. Good. Okay, Thanks. excellent. Sorry, um, Robert. I just wanted to elaborate on the sense of place uh, provincial policy statement um, policy uh, that one uh, seven one, and I'll just quote it because it's a really little known policy, but it's very important for cultural heritage. So. Um, Long-term economic prosperity should be supported by encouraging sense of place by promoting well-designed built form and cultural planning and by conserving features that help define character, including built heritage resources and cultural heritage landscapes. So that's an existing PPS policy that I think is really important when we start talking about protecting context. 
Very good. I think that uh, the, there's there's another principle here in what you're saying, and that is to look for uh, policies that affect heritage that may not have the word heritage attached to them. So the particular part of the PPS you're referring to, uh, if you were just doing a search for for the word heritage, it wouldn't come up, um, and uh, it and 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 yet it it has a great influence, um, and so it's something that people perhaps haven't haven't noticed before. So I, I, it's a very good, uh, a very good point. Um, shall I move on to the next, uh, next question? Okay. What considerations are being made to protect heritage farms, including barns, silos, outbuildings, fences, walls, and farmhouses, including their collective arrangement? Um, my note in here is that this is what we might call a cultural heritage landscape, potentially. Um, this is particularly important in today's cities, as today's cities expand into farmland. Are the provisions of the PPS regarding cultural landscape lands, cultural heritage landscapes adequate for the job? Who would like to uh, pick perhaps that up? I can, I, perhaps oh. I can take that that one to start. Um, so the PPS 2020 has a couple changes to the definition of cultural heritage landscapes. And in particular, uh, buildings and views have been added, which gets at some of what the question is talking about. The existing definition already talks about uh, interrelationships and how the pieces might, might be uh, connected to each other. Uh, but there's some other uh, significant changes made to that definition that I think are really important because uh, the um, how one might address a cultural landscape, the, the addition that's been added is really in reference to the Planning Act and some of the planning tools, meaning that uh, the previous PPS may be focused more on the Ontario Heritage Act side of this, but what the definition now does is, is, is it starts speaking to use. As we think about you know, how a property, how a landscape is used can be key to its heritage value. And you really need to work with the Planning Act for that. So one of the changes is that um, official plans, zoning, and other planning mechanisms uh, are now one of the ways in which cultural landscapes uh, can be protected. And I think that that helps get at this broader piece around around use. Um, and then, of course, the uh, existing dev definition that it, that it builds on covers uh, many of the issues that can be applied to agricultural landscapes. Thank you, um, Anne. You had a comment, I believe. Yes, I just want to just follow up from something that Sean just said as well. Um, well, the Heritage Act is the planning act that protects you. So you can't, it's very difficult to use the Heritage Act to conserve, to conserve an actual use. But if you are concerned about um, the conservation of far farms, then you have to use uh, the Planning Act processes under the zoning bylaw to try and conserve um, farms. If it's the heritage buildings and structures on the farm that you are concerned about, then you have to, the, the best way to conserve them is using, the, to designate them. Um, and you can designate them, as Robert just said, either as individual buildings on a property or as a heritage landscape. Um, and then when you look at that, is the issue is whether or not they the, they comply with OREG 906 requirements. It is always more difficult on the urban fringe where you're going to have um, growth gobbling up uh, previously um, farmland. The best way to do to conserve these buildings on the urban fringe is to find another use um, for them. Um, it's always it's easier to keep the farmhouse and integrate that as growth and change is taking place around. But actually keeping old agricultural buildings is extremely difficult. You need to find a new use for them because they're not going to be conserved in the long term unless they are have a practical purpose. Okay, thank you. I think that what's coming out of this discussion is the the importance into the future of <clears throat> of this concept of cultural landscapes, something we all uh, need to learn more about and uh, to uh, maybe learn from the practice in uh, in other countries um, for for conservation. Um, I'm going to move on now to to the next uh, question. Um, in the past, I used to rely on checking my local weekly 
weekly newspaper for notice of upcoming informal public meetings to discuss proposed zoning and official plan changes. Issues raised at the informal public meetings were worked on by the uh, proponent and the municipal planners. Sometimes developers organized follow-up meetings to discuss with citizens. Um, it could be 12 to 18 months and three or four resubmissions later before the vastly revised proposal came to formal public meeting um, and a decision was made. Is that scenario a thing of the past? I can jump in there if you wish. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, Danielle first and then uh, yeah. Anne. Okay. Great. Um, so yeah, Anne, if you want to chime in afterwards, but the Planning Act, what is set up in the Planning Act around public meetings and consultation requirements are minimum requirements that must be met. And so nothing around changing the timelines through Bill 108 actually changed any of those minimum requirements for consultation that were set out. So municipalities continue to be able to go beyond the minimum requirements for public meetings in engaging the public and stakeholders on those planning matters. So yeah, those provisions were not necessarily affected by the timelines, although we realize that um, there could be some added pressure that comes onto that. And uh, Robert, one of the next question actually in the sequence that you sent when you mentioned uh, questions that could be upcoming, also talked a little bit about different notice provisions. And I wanted to speak to that in the same vein as this question, because I think it goes alongside. So municipalities, uh, changes were made to the Planning Act that allow municipalities to come up with um, sort of locally specific uh, um, situations for how it is that they want to communicate public meetings and also what those consultations should look like. So municipalities are able to tailor what that looks like to meet their uh, local requirements and the context. So that would be establishing alternative measures in their official plan for how they want to inform the public about a meeting and also how they wish to obtain the views of the public on that matter. Uh, Anne, you, you were going to comment? Yes, I was going to say uh, that with this lockdown that we've had, most um, every municipality uh, now have their staff working at home. And so municipalities these days, they tend to have all of their information online now. So if you want to be following a planning application, um, that information should be online. Um, so you should be able to um, see that online and contact the relevant planner. And the other thing to do is to contact, if you're concerned about an application, is to contact your local councillor who should be able to help you too. Is she the one who was doing the medical Okay. Uh, someone has got their, uh, has got their uh, microphone on. Uh, if you would uh, turn off the microphone. Oh, yes. Yeah, she is there. Yeah. Okay. Um, Doctors. I'm notice. I'm looking at our time. We're down to um, to I think not That's enough right. time for That's another right. one of these long uh, hey, questions. Excuse me. Someone has their microphone on. Would you please turn it off? Uh, I can't oh. remember. That's the problem. I get something. We just I have to compete, it. I guess. I want to thank it. everybody who's uh, participated today, and uh, especially uh, the, the panelists who um, have taken quite a bit of time and effort to address all of these questions. I would invite people who have suggestions for for other webinars or or. Uh, uh, meetings like this uh, to be organized by Ontario uh, the Architectural Conservancy or Community Heritage Ontario to uh, please let your executive know uh, and we'll try to arrange more of these things. Once again, thank you very much all of the people who've joined and particular thanks to the to the panelists. The problem was you had a good idea. I think. We never trained you. Uh,